Ok, good morning, בוקר טוב לכולם, שמי חואן רובר, אני ממטריקס, מסיס מוצרי תוכנה, ואני מנהל אגף במטריקס. אנחנו פה בוובינר משותף עם חברת אלתר, מטריקס ואלתר שותפות מזה מספר שנים, התחלנו את הפעילות שלנו עם אלתר סביב פתרונות רפיד מיינר, פתרון AI מוביל, ויש לנו מספר התקנות מעניינות שבהזדמנות לא היום, נשמח לספר עליהם. והיום אנחנו עושים וובינר סביב מוסר מאוד מעניין של אלתר, שנקרא SLC. אני מניח שכולכם מכירים שפתרונות SAS מהווים שדרה מרכזית בלא מעט ארגונים בעולם ובישראל. פתרונות האלה חיים 30 שנה, והיום, כמו במרבית ארגונים, יש סוג של מתח בין הצורך לבצע מודרניזציה ארגונית, לרוץ קדימה, ומצד שני להביא להתייעלות או לחיסכון כספי, ואנחנו רואים את זה בעצם בכל הארגונים, ובפתח הזה שבין התייעלות ארגונית, חיסכון כסף במודרניזציה, בפתח הזה נכנסת אלתיר עם פתרון SLC, שבעצם זה פתרון SAS, כמו שאתם מכירים אצלכם בארגון, Uh, כאשר האלתר uh, uh, SLC מ- מספק סביבה שהיא סביבת SAS מודרנית שיכולה להריץ open source, יכולה להריץ uh, 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 code python ובעצם מביא אתכם קדימה ל- ל- לכיוון המודרניזציה ארגונית להיות uh, 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 cloud ready ובעצם עם הנכסים שקיימים שלכם היום בSAS יש לכם יכולת להעביר אותן ל-SLC בצורה פשוטה ולהוסיף נכסים נוספים שאתם מפתחים היום בכלים אה, אה, שהם לא SAS ולקבל בעצם מבט על בפלטפורמה מלאה אה, 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 בעצם על כל אה, נושא הסאס שלכם בארגון. הפתרון של SLC אה, אה, הוא ידידותי, הוא drag and drop, הוא מודרני אה, כמו שבעצם אנחנו מצפים שפתרון יהיה בשנים שלנו. אחד היתרונות המשמעותיים מעבר לנושא של מודרניזציה ארגונית ויכולת לרוץ קדימה בצורה מהירה בבניית ארכיטקטורה שהיא ארכיטקטורה היברידית זה בעצם היכולת להפחית עלויות בצורה משמעותית אתם יודעים, כל מספר שאני אגיד כרגע יישמע קצת, אה, אה, קצת מוזר, אבל בכל מקרה אני אגיד, הפחתת העלויות יכולה להגיע ללמעלה מ-50% ממה שאתם מכירים היום בעולמות הסאס שבהם אתם משתמשים. המיגרציה היא מיגרציה קלה ל-SLC, הנכסים שפיתחתם במהלך המון 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 שנים נשמרים, כמובן חובת ההוכחה עלינו ואנחנו אה, נשמח להוכיח שגם אה, יש לנו פתרון שהוא פתרון טוב, מודרני, cloud ready, מתאים מארכיטקטורת אה, 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 מיינפריים עד לארכיטקטורה מודרנית אה, וכמו שאמרתי חיסכון בעלויות שהוא מאוד 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 משמעותי וככה כמו שאמרתי בהתחלה, אנחנו נכנסים לפרצה בין הצורך לעשות מודרניזציה ולרוץ קדימה לבין הצורך אה, אה, לחסוך עלויות. ובדיוק בנקודה הזאת אנחנו נמצאים, ב, אה, אנחנו בהחלט נשמח להיות בקשר עם כל אחד ואחד מכם ולהוכיח ששתי אה, הדברים האלה מתק, מתקיימים ב, במקום אחד. אה, אני רוצה שוב להודות לכם על ההשתתפות היום ואני רוצה להעביר את המקל אחריי לאוליבר ולמרגרט מחברת אלתר. אוליבר, please take it from here, ושוב תודה לכולם. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, everyone, for joining me to explore some of the challenges with data and analytics platform modernization. So firstly, I'd like to provide a brief background on Altair. 
cover some key challenges experienced by organisations using SaaS language, provide an overview of broader capabilities and ease of migration, um, also to talk about some customers and also a brief summary. So firstly, some background. Altair were founded just over 35 years ago in Detroit, Michigan, as a software and services provider to product engineering groups at automotive companies. Since then, though, the company's grown a lot. Today, we have over 3,000 employees, 74 offices in 27 countries, and more than 1,300 customers in many verticals. Altair acquired World Programming, who have been building Altair SLC since the year 2000. It's very much an engineering company, helping organizations move away from SaaS software and migrate to cloud with more flexible and modern technology, with minimal business impact, and without the associated risk of unproven technology. We've migrated over 500 customers to the Altair SLC platform, including Banca de Spania, Credit Agricole, Zurich, Experian, AXA, Unicredit, and Fidelity. So why did Altair acquire World Programming? Well, firstly, because of the SaaS language capability, enabling customers to run and develop their SaaS language programs without any of the associated risks and large license fees and to migrate quickly to cloud. We've also extended our analytics platform by integrating open source technology, adding machine learning, delivering low code, no code workflow, and building a deployment framework that enables organizations to remove all the barriers to monetize their data. So what are the challenges that we see in the marketplace? We see a few challenges. However, consistently we see these four, licensing, development, deployment, and also governance. So firstly, licensing. Graduates, they're coming out of university really only knowing open source. And most companies want to use open source because, well, they think it's completely free. However, there are mission critical SaaS language programs or models, which are a result of 10 or more years intellectual property. They keep the lights switched on, they're critical to the organization. To convert these programs is problematic due to resource constraints, cost, complexity, and time. And sometimes it's not even possible. So this will have serious implications to any modernization strategy. Most companies believe the only way to run these programs is through an expensive SaaS software license. Altair SLC addresses this. We have our own compiler, which means you can develop new or run existing SaaS language programs without any SaaS software. So this enables customers to migrate SaaS language to cloud immediately without any lengthy, costly, and problematic code conversion or replatforming. This also typically drives approximately 70% savings. Altair SLC has the capability to utilize not just SaaS language, but also open source. It's a language agnostic tool and support for other languages are also being considered for the platform. Not only does Altair SLC accelerate the migration to cloud, but it also provides organizations with an accelerated migration to Python, if this is an objective or uh, part of the modernization strategy. Now this approach utilizes cloud from day one and eliminates the risk in moving to, to open source. So secondly, development. Large organizations, they have analytical silos, data engineers, analysts, scientists, statisticians. And what comes with this is a large and fragmented tool set to help each profile deal with the different stages of the analytical life cycle. Altair SLC provides an end-to-end -end platform that enables users to connect, prepare, discover, and model any data, and also deliver those outputs on demand or via a scheduler. There's a flexible user interface for users that wish to code or drag and drop. This enables rationalization of tools, it drives productivity, delivers cost savings, inspires collaboration, and of course, accelerates the, uh, the modernization strategy as well. Third challenge is deployment. I touched on deployment just now. There's an elusive yet significant wall between a developer and the DevOps team, where much of the code produced for production needs to be sometimes recoded or, or factored to suit an enterprise deployment process. 
The issue here sits with the time and the responsibility for a DevOps team to really understand the logic for recoding, for testing and maintenance. And the result can see weeks or even months before a program is deployed into a production environment. We eliminate the need for recoding through the use of an API. Any program developed in R, Python, or SAS language, or via a drag and drop workflow, can be uploaded to the SLC hub. And with the correct permissions through a click step wizard, you can deploy this for on-demand use. This enables the consumers of the analytics, whether they're business users or end customers, to have self-service. It also means that organizations can integrate CRMs, other cloud applications, customer apps, and websites to utilize the models and programs in real time. So this delivers the democratization of data and analytics. Um, so the fourth challenge, governance, we've talked about different types of users, all of which are looking to access cloud data and data sources that are still on premise. Now controlling the access and providing visibility of version history is also key to enterprise governance and security. SLC Hub enables an organization to centrally control the data access and credential management. Integration with Git enables version control and user profile management enables control over who can deploy to test pre-production and production environments. So we've so much to show. Marguerite can cover all of these in her functional overview and address the challenges that I mentioned earlier. Accelerating the modernization journey, so migrating existing SaaS language platform. Um, just a, an overview, really, Altair SLC will accelerate the move to cloud. The transition to Altair SLC protects the investment in SaaS language and also modernizes the platform. It will retain existing skills whilst enabling utilization of new talent. It can reduce the SaaS language cost by approximately 70%. There are three key phases to the transition process. Phase one is the discovery phase. Now this is where we establish some key detail on the scope of use of SaaS language and also the interactivity. This includes database connectivity, interactive users use, uh, the number of systems, interoperability with other software and platforms, the number of production jobs and the current platform architecture. In addition, we look to understand the programs and applications that are in use. Now, also as part of the initial phase, we perform a code analysis. Now, this is where Altair SLC can be installed on a workstation and pointed to a directory containing a copy of the SAS language programs. It won't run them or access any data, but it will scan the syntax um, and language usage in each program to produce an instant compatibility report. We often see a very high level of instant compatibility of approximately 95% when 95% of the SAS language programs can be lifted and shifted to run in Altair SLC immediately. The transition is really focused on implementing solutions for the remaining 5% or so. Our solutions and engineering team have a lot of experience with this through the many transitions we've successfully performed to date. The final step of phase one is to complete a transition plan to include recommendations of further analysis identified in the initial analysis. And then once the transition is complete, a pilot phase is optional. Um, there's also flexibility around the duration of the pilot before rolling out. Altair well, SLC is available on multiple platforms, including your preferred cloud or private cloud, on-premise mainframe, or as a managed service. So, uh, just to, to summarize um, some of the things we, we've talked about, Altair SLC will accelerate the move to cloud. Altair SLC will eliminate the risk of migrating SaaS language to cloud. It will retain existing skills whilst enabling utilization of new talent. Uh, Altair SLC will also accelerate the journey to open source whilst utilize, utilizing cloud from day one um, and eliminating risk. It can also reduce SaaS language costs by up to 70%. Obviously that can then be, be invested in the transformation strategy. Um, Altair provide units and how do units work? Well, Altair have pioneered a patented units-based subscription licensing model 
for software, which has transformed the way our customers streamline product innovation and get to market faster. Customers have full access to all of our Rapid Miner suite instantly, including Altera AI Studio um, for creating and deploying generative AI models. These can be run on demand locally or in the cloud. Packaged as a comprehensive set of applications, our units-based structure is scalable, shareable, and more cost-effective than obtaining individual licenses. So thank you very much for taking the time to explore these challenges with me. I would now like to hand over to Marguerite to provide a functional and technical view. Thank you, Oliver, for the introduction to our platform. Let me go straight into the functional overview. As part of the overview, I would like to show you our user interface, which consists of two main parts, one being the coding perspective and the other the workflow perspective, which is more of a drag and drop functionality for quickly building ETL processes, analytics or models with minimal to no coding. After that, I will go into our other product called SLC Hub, which is an orchestrator and allows on-demand deployment of analytics or models to REST APIs. It manages user access to the platform and data sources and enables creation of pipelines, which can be scheduled. First, let's take a look at the coding perspective. What you see on your screen in front of you right now is what we call the Altair Analytics Workbench. So this is what we have as our user interface for users to interact with the SLC compiler. As you can see, I've got a SAS language program open in front of me here. And the SAS language program is color coded in such a way that it's really familiar for users that are familiar with this coding. Over and above that, we also integrate with the procedures available to the SAS language and also PROC SQL, which the users should be familiar with as well. Over and above that, we have integrated what we call a PROC Python or a PROC R wrapper. What happens in this wrapper is if you have a look on top here, we've got a data step where we create a data set called Arbin. In the PROC Python, wrapper, we would like to use this data set. So in terms of exporting the data, we export a data set to a data frame, and this data frame can then be used in the actual Python code. Similarly, this is done for PROC R as well. What is important to understand for both Python and R is that SLC does not actually compile the code. What, ha what happens is the following. If you have SLC installed in your environment and you are running a piece of code where you've got Python or R integrated into your code, this code will be sent, submitted from SLC to the installation of Python or R that you have on the same server or desktop. And then the code is executed within the Python or R environment. When it's done, the output will be returned to SLC and displayed in the workbench for the users. The reason for doing this is that we want to enable enterprises to manage their Python and R environments on their own. An example being Python has a lot of libraries that, might, that a user might want to use. If we were to package Python with SLC, we would have to determine which libraries we want to include and which ones we want to exclude. This would mean that it's not so flexible for enterprises. The way we've structured it now, enterprises can decide for themselves what they want to have in their Python or R environment and whatever inst installation they've done for Python or R will be able to run within this code. So whatever libraries you need, if you've installed them, you'll be able, able to execute them with this code. On the other hand, by creating this Python wrapper or R wrapper, we enable users to integrate Python and R code directly into their coding. As you can see, initially we start off with the SAS language code. After that, we go into a Python code. We were using the same data set that we were using previously. And from there, we are going into an R code, again with the same data set. Therefore, you can interleave the different languages within your coding environment and you, there's no need for jumping over into a different platform to run anything either in Python or R. 
Before we run this, let me take the log. As you can see, we've got a log available and this is interchangeable. Any of these tabs on top here can be moved around. And if I run this code now, you will see that the code is executing in the log as well. You can see the verbose code, verbose code and also see the execution time. If any errors are up, popping up, you'd be able to see these in red and you'd be able to follow on on the side where the errors are. As an example, if I want to go to this warning, I can click on the button and it takes me directly onto this warning. Additionally, we also have an output viewer. Here we've got the output in an HTML format, but this is also available in other formats. As you can see, we've got a frequency procedure output, which looks very familiar if you are used to the way frequency procedures are, are displayed. We've got some univariate procedures for all the different variables in the data set. And if we go down, we'll see the Python and the R output. Very important to note, as you can see, this Python output looks different to the SAS language output. The reason for this is it is displayed exactly the same way it would have been displayed in your Python installation. Whatever Python IDE you are using, the display of the results will be the same in the workbench as it would have been in your Python installation. Also, this applies to using your R. So for R, we have a dedicated R IDE and it will display it in a specific way and that is how you would see it here as well. Again, for this specific procedure, R would give us some residual charts and these residual charts are all available within the workbench as well. Oliver has previously alluded to the code analysis. The code analysis is a very important step in identifying how compatible your code is with the SLC compiler. It is a very simple and easy step to, to reproduce if you've got a folder, you can navigate to the folder where you've got .sas files in. If you right click on that folder and say analyze and program compatibility, it will immediately pass all the information and have a look at what procedures are not compatible. It will also give an indication of what percentage of your code is compatible and which one is not. On the other hand, we also have the Server Explorer. As you can see, we've set up the libraries, again, in a very familiar way. Maps, says help, says user. We've got our persistent libraries that we've created in our code, as well as our work library. The work library being the temporary li library where temporary um, tables are being stored. If we go onto the tables, we can double click them and view the tables. Over and above that, though, we can also open something we call a data profiler. The data profiler has some additional information regarding the table that you are viewing. First up, we see the metadata view. The metadata view gives you an indication of the types that each of the variables are, the classification, how many missing values there are how many distinct values, and some of the frequency distributions. We also have a univariate view, which is really nice in terms of exploratory analysis because it gives you some official statistics for each of the variables already, such as the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, and it can be augmented to include other measures that you may need. Under the univariate charts, we can have a look at the distribution for each of the variables with a frequency chart, and all of this can be copied onto the clipboard and used in other applications. Then we have the correlation analysis. Here we can take all of the variables, create a correlation coefficient matrix, and you will see that we have blocks for each of the variables that are related to the other variables. Even if you can't see them, there is a relationship if you click on the box, you will see that you have the coefficient as well as, well as the p-value available to you. And last but not least, we've got something we call the predictive power. Here we've got a variable that is, consists of zero and ones. It's a binary variable. 
if I choose the binary binary variable as my dependent variable, it will now give me an indication of some statistics of each of the independent variables relating to that dependent variable. If I now have a look, for instance, at age, it will also give me a frequency chart of the breakdown of age across the variable dv um, to give me an indication of how each of the independent variables is actually relating to the dependent variable. Next to this codings perspective, what we call a SAS language perspective, we have a workflow perspective. If we have a look at the workflow perspective, you will see that this is a drag and drop functionality. In terms of the drag and drop functionality, we have a whole bunch of groupings here and under the groupings, there are some blocks that you can use. These blocks are, pre are blocks that can be configured easily to import data or to do data preparation and modeling as well as scoring. What's nice here is we've also included some code blocks. These code blocks enable users to code up anything in Python, R, SAS language or SQL, which is possibly not available within any of the other groupings that we have given you. If you have a look at this, we've got a simple ETL process. We've got some data here. We've got January. It's just some data where we've got four variables and a number of observations. February is set up the same way as is March. And now what we want to do is we want to merge these. As you can see, each of these blocks has the number of observations and the number of variables listed next to the data set, which makes it easy to follow on the flow in which the process is going. Here we want to merge the data set. We are concatenating the data set. You can dictate what order you want each of these to be in. And you will see that if we take all of these observations and add them together, we'll get 5,700 observations. Additionally, we want to create some aggregation. If you look at that, you can create a whole bunch of different functions with the variables that you have available in your data set. And you will choose the variable that you want to aggregate on as well as create a new variable name. And then for the aggregations, you can choose which variable you want to group on. This now reduces the number of observations because we've created a whole bunch of aggregates. And we want to now join with the demographics. This is a different data set, as you can see. We've got some additional information on the demographics of the customers with specific IDs, and we are doing a join. As you can see in the data preparation blocks, we have joins, but we also have queries. A join is a simple join where if you look, you, you just join on a specific variable. You could also ask to do a query where you can have where statements or if statements that you can include in your query. This is a simple ETL process, but what we can also do, we can also go over into a workflow, uh, into a model build. Within the model build, you will see that we've got a whole bunch of different models that we front-ended. So we've got some decision trees, we've got some clustering, we've got regression, neural networks, but additionally to that, we allow you to do reject inferencing, build a scorecard, and also do a weights of evidence transform. Just on weights of evidence transform, what you would see here is you can choose the variables you want to do the transform on. Transform on. If you then go to optimization and choose, for instance, age, it gives you all the relevant uh, measures to identify how the groupings are and whether they fit your model. You can also see if the grouping that was suggested, so you've got a whole bunch of different options, you've got optimal binning, you've got equal width binning, equal height binning, and Windsorized binning. If you choose any of those options and you're not happy with the groupings, you can simply go and change all the groupings as you see fit. This gives you transparency and allows you the flexibility to build the models as you see fit. We've built a logistic regression, and within the logistic regression, we have now gone and, well, before the logistic regression, we've gone and split the data set into a development and test data set. We now take this logistic regression and score it. Once we've scored it, 
both for the development as well as the test sample. We analyze it and we'll see that we get some statistics around the actual um, models that model that we've built. In terms of performance measures, we've got the gains chart, gains chart, the ROC chart, the chaos chart, as well as the lift chart. Over and above that, we also have statistics. These are industry-specific statistics. And as you can see, we've got some accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, etc. And each of these is calculated for the development as well as the test sample. For each of the samples, you will see highlighted for which, which of the samples performs best for which of the statistics. Last but not least, we also have a confusion matrix available for you. Before we go into a um, into, into looking at the hub, um, we've got some blocks here which can be used to prep a specific workflow for the hub. If you want to have specific inputs, for instance, I've created the logistic regression here. I now want to make this ready to be used as an API. However, I need some parameters to be inputted into this specific model before it can run, such as age, education, and all of these. All of this information needs to be inputted by either a customer or uh, an agent or whoever is doing the application for a credit card in this instance. So I'm prepping it by creating some program inputs. And at the end, I want some program results because I would like to display to the customer that the customer has either been approved or not approved for the credit card. So before keeping that in mind, before I show you how we deploy all of this, let me go into the hub. The hub is our orchestrator. What the hub can do is, for one, access management. It does access management to the portal itself, as well as access management to data sources. Additionally to that, under the deployment services, we can deploy models as well as any form of analytics that we've done in the workflow to the hub and create REST APIs. Additionally, we can also create pipelines within the deployment services, which can be scheduled and run automatically. Let's start off with the hub administration. With the, within the hub administration, you can create users and groups and roles. What you should know is that users and groups can also be imported from Active Directory and do not need to manually be created. Roles, on the other hand, are necessary in order to manage the roles within the hub. What you can do, you can create different namespaces. Namespaces are there in order to, for instance, keep different departments separate from each other. If you would like to have a finance department, give the finance department access to a specific area within the hub and separate that from the credit risk department, that is possible via namespaces. The namespaces then are completely separate, separate, and finance and credit risk will not be able to see each other's environments. Within the hub administration, you will also be able to see access control logs. This is where you can follow on and see exactly who's been accessing what and when. Additionally to that, you can have a monitor over your servers. So just so you know, within the hub, you can have more than one server connected to enable workload, workload balancing. And you can have up to 32 what we call worker nodes connected to the hub. Um, and the way it works, if you've got, for instance, four worker nodes and you would like to run something on the hub, if you've got access to specific worker nodes, then whatever you are submitting in terms of jobs to the worker nodes, the hub will choose which worker nodes currently has enough resources available to execute that program or that job. Then we've also got the enterprise functionality, and this is where we can create um, access to specific data sources without having to give each user usernames and passwords to the data sources. As an example, if we go to library definitions and we have a look at a 
uh, and a Postgres database that we've got connection here to. You can see we've created the connect connection. The username and password on are encrypted, at least the password is encrypted, nobody can read that. But what you can do is you can create libname bindings and assign these to specific people. An example is for this specific database, I have a libname binding created called libh. If I now go back into my workbench and I have a look at my hub libraries, you will take note that I've got a library called libh. This libh is automatically pushed to me via the hub and I do, need, do not need to create a connection to it. If I open that, I have access to all the tables within this database. That's basically what the library definitions are there for. These library definitions can also be published for purposes of using them, for instance, and creating connections to Excel. Within Excel, we have something we call a hub plugin. The hub plugin allows you to connect to data sets that are available via the hub or create functions and access certain uh, packages that have been uploaded and deployed to the hub. We'll get to that in, in a few minutes. And last but not least, we've got the deployment services. Within the deployment services, you can create different artifacts where you're going to upload all of your packages to, and then you can deploy any packages that you've created within the workbench and uploaded and find those that are deployed within your directory. As an example, I've deployed that particular model that we were speaking about. Um, and as you can see here, after deployment, I've got a synchronous API endpoint available as well as an asynchronous execution URL. What I can do, I can execute this specific API to test it. So I've given for the parameters, the inputs that I need, I've given some default values if I run this, it now tells me that my decision is congratulations, you've been approved. Let's see how easy it is to actually change this. If I go back to my workflow and I want to change the output, I'm going to change the output and say, I would like to now have a longer message which says congratulations, you have been approved for a WPS gold credit card. Now we need to take this and we need to upload this. It has been saved. I go and right click on the folder of my project. I say upload to SLC Hub. I need to upload it to version four. And as you can see, we've got integrated versioning control as well and it's already been uploaded. That is how quick you can upload your projects. I now go back to my Hub. I go back to my deployment services. I'll go back to deployment and we will see under my deployment here, I can click on this, which is my deployment. I can change the version and I will find version four. I can continue. Very important. If you want an API endpoint to create it, this box needs to be ticked. And I can say finish and it's deployed the, the package successfully. I can now go to my directory. If I go back to my categories and back to my program and I now test this program on the same parameters, it will now say congratulations, you have been approved for WPS Gold credit card. This is how quickly you can deploy anything from the workbench to the hub. Just as an example, we can also use this in another environment. So this is a completely separate product. I've created a dashboard where I can input the parameters. So as an example, I'm going to use exactly the same input parameters and press on submit. And it gives me the same message, congratulations, you have been approved and also a score. Just so that you can see how real time this is. If I, for instance, now go and now say a 12 year old male in grade nine and submit, and this 12 year old male has not been approved. And as you can see, the score is considerably lower. So real time API calls to the hub, which can be executed very easily.
The other thing we have within our deployment services is pipelines. Now, pipelines are really nice specifically to create ETL processes or any automated processes that need to run regularly. What we have here, so initially you can see we've got a whole bunch of different nodes. Specifically, also, we've given you some control nodes that you can use to control the process. You can either write a specific SRC program and just start writing the program. Alternatively, what you can also do is create a hub package. This is what I've done here. I'm taking a whole bunch of data from server A, server B, and server C, and then I want to aggregate, uh, aggregate them and also get some demographic information added to it. It's as simple as taking the uploaded package and specifying the program and it will be up, it will, you'll be able to use it in these um, processes. As you can see here, I've got a node, which is a success node. This indicates that all of these processes need to go, need to be successful before the process can continue. So the process will only continue if everything has executed successfully. You can also, if you have an SMTP server, connect the SMTP server to the hub and thereby allowing users to send emails via the pipelines as well. If we now execute this pipeline, you can see it, whenever something has executed, it will get a green tick. That indicates that it has executed, executed successfully. If it didn't execute successfully, successfully and you would like to see the log, you click on the I, you'll be able to access the log and you'll be able to interrogate the log to see what went wrong. These pipelines can also be scheduled. We have two triggers available, one being time-based, the other one being file event trigger. The file event trigger is pretty basic in the sense that it either triggers if the file arrives or if it already exists. The time-based trigger will allow you to schedule the pipeline at any point in time. We've got lots of options and above that, we also have an advanced, advanced option where you can do a cron expression in order to have it exactly the way you would like to have it scheduled. Lastly, we have an invocation portal. The invocation portal allows you to call programs that are stored within the hub. So if you would like, if you if someone deploys a program and anyone else in the department would like to run that program, they can go and look for that program within the invocation portal. We'll go with the same example. Um, we've got our default values again. We can give it a job label, which means we can identify at the label what job was running and then the executes and the output is given to you as well. Within the Excel plugin, one of the things you can do is do batch scoring, for instance. So here we've got exactly the same um, model that we built earlier. We've got some parameters, but they are in a batch format. If we want to score these, for instance, um, via the hub, we can highlight them and say insert function. I now find the process which has been created to batch score and it's been uploaded to the hub. I need to specify the data. I also need to specify where I want the output. And I can insert that. And there we have our decision. So it tells us what the score is, tells us what the decision is. Um, and this is how you can do batch scoring very simply and, and efficiently. I think we can hand over to um, Q&A now. Thank you very much for listening to me and I hope that you could learn some valuable information. Um, please go ahead and ask as many questions as you want. All right. Thank you so much, Oliver and Margaret. We received some brilliant questions. And the first one is from Daniel. Does SLC provide the ability to migrate all our existing SAS language to a modern cloud architecture like GCP? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'll take that one, Rona. Thank you. Um, indeed, Altair SLC allows you to to quickly migrate to your preferred cloud platform. Um, GCP is actually a, a cloud partner of Altair's, and um, Altair SLC is available on the Google Marketplace, so very easy to use. And Nir asks, will SLC provide the ability to, uh, to develop new processes in Python and also use Python when modernizing existing processes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and this is one of the key benefits that you can utilize new talent that have Python skills um, under the same roof with your, your SAS skills. So if you have a process, let's say it's a, I don't know, a credit risk process and it's written in SAS, um, and then maybe you want to modernize that, rewrite it, or, or maybe just rewrite a part of it, you can do that in the language of choice, whether that's SAS language, Python, R, um, or SQL, or, or using the workflow tool to, to create that new process as well. So there, there's lots of options there, um, allowing you really to use the, the language of choice that fits the, the job the best. And the next, next question is from Noah. Can we use APIs to integrate our SAS program into other cloud processes and applications? Indeed, yeah. So this is one of the, the key aspects of, of modernization and utilizing cloud technology. And it allows you to link any of your processes, whether it's SAS or Python R or a combination of those languages or even a workflow to an API endpoint. Um, and the benefits of this mean that you can then integrate it with any other cloud packages that you're using um, any other business critical tools, your CRM um, for um, real time analytics, um, things like next best actions or or recommendations um, or credit risk decisioning, um, but also you know from websites and apps. So when your clients are online on your website or on an app um, that, that you're providing, it can also serve real time analytics as well and AI. And next question is from Gil. Can SLC compile that language macro functions? So I'm happy to take that one. Um, yes, um, SLC can compile macro functions. We fully integrate it with macro functions. So even if you want to include a code that's stored somewhere else and you want to use the percent include function, all of that is available. All right, and next question is from Sharon. Can access risk restrictions can uh, be applied to users and groups within SLC Hub? Yes, so the Hub administrator would typically have access to the full Hub um, environment and the Hub administra administrator can split the users into different groups. Um, that can also be done via Active Directory. And then using the namespaces, you can also split the users into different areas within the hub so that certain areas can only have access to certain um, uploaded up or deployments etc but um, it also enables you to split the different access to data sources within the groups as well so yes definitely possible all right and the last question is from Lior can SLC read SAS 7 bdat files yes uh, so uh, SLC is able to read SAS 7B dot files. It's also able to write SAS 7B dot files. Um, there are some restrictions. SLC has its own file format called WPD, and everything, including indexing and appending, etc., is able. It, you are able to do that with WPD files, but you can convert files easily from SAS 7B dot to the proprietary format from SLC. Amazing. So I think that that's it. That's all the questions that we have. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Robert, uh, Group Manager at Matrix, Oliver Perley, Global Director at Altair, and Margaret Colho. Do I pronounce it correctly? Um, Data Analytics Solutions Specialist at Altair. Thank you all for joining us today and hope to see you on our next webinars. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.